What's up animal lovers? I am Evasive and if you watch my last video then you know that I have some very, very controversial opinions. But the thing is that last video got so many views that I realized the only way I'm ever going to be successful on YouTube is if I just be as controversial as possible. So I have made the tough but necessary career decision to change my YouTube channel to a political commentary channel. Now I know this is not what most of you subscribed for, but hey, I gotta get views, okay? Money me, money now. Me a money needing a lot now. So to kick off this change, I wanna be discussing one of the most important pieces of political media ever made, Bedtime for Bonzo. It's a movie where uh, Ronald Reagan adopts a chimpanzee. <laughs> The year is 1951. The babies are booming and Ronald Reagan was president of the Screen Actors Guild, where his main job was enforcing anti-strike laws and blacklisting other actors with suspected communist ties. During this year, the future ruler of the Western world released what is now considered to be his magnum opus, Bedtime for Bonzo. Are you mystified, bewildered, and puzzled? You needn't be. All these shenanigans take place in a hilarious new Hollywood movie called Bedtime for Bonzo starring Ronald Reagan, Diana Lynn, and Bonzo, that amazing chimp. In modern times, we know from experience what a terrible idea it is to have a live chimpanzee on a movie set. Anyone who read the news in 2009 or saw the Gordy scene from Nope last year knows that even the friendliest chimps are still wild animals that can suddenly go berserk and tear people's faces off. And while the actors in this movie were spared from such a gruesome fate, the chimpanzee did almost kill Reagan during the production when it grabbed Reagan by the tie and pulled so hard he nearly suffocated and had to have the tie cut off him by a crew member. And then mysteriously, the chimpanzee itself died of suffocation from smoke inhalation in a fire that happened a week after the movie came out. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that Reagan had anything to do with that fire, just like how Reagan had nothing to do with selling missiles to Iran in 1985, okay? I'm sure he had nothing to do with that, okay? He had nothing to do with that. We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages nor will we. Obviously I wasn't around in the 1980s, but from what I've seen, the very existence of Bedtime for Bonzo was a running joke among Democrats and liberals during the Reagan era. Late night comedians joked about it, punk songs referenced it, comic strips referenced it, TV shows referenced it. My running mate in the forthcoming elections will be someone for whom I have always had the profoundest respect. My old mate, Bonzo. Oh. And of course, college students at the time played the movie on theater screens where they cheered and threw stuff at the screen like it was Rocky Horror Picture Show. And as Ronald Reagan, playing the part of a college professor, tries to bring up a chimpanzee to act like a human being in the movie Bedtime for Bonzo, the young audience behaves as if maybe they've been brought up to act like chimpanzee. I don't know, it's funny, but it's giving me really big Donald Trump vibes, you know? Like, haha, oh my gosh, so funny. Bedtime for Bonzo, Reagan with a chimpanzee. This guy's so dumb, he could never be president. And then, 36 years later, haha, Donald Trump. Haha, make Donald Trump again. Oh, oh, make Donald Trump again. Make Donald Trump again. You're fired. You're fired. Haha, <laughs> you're fired. This guy could never be president of the United States. Haha. <laughs> um, I don't want to do the political commentary thing anymore. I'm just going to talk about the movie now. So Bedtime for Bonzo opens with Ronald Reagan telling Bonzo to jump off a five-story building and kill himself. Go ahead, Bonzo. I want you to jump. Jump, Bonzo. Jump. Peter, what are you doing? Jump, Bonzo. Jump. <laughs> Naturally though, Reagan's words don't work on Bonzo. Bonzo may be suicidal, but he does not want his death to be in vain. So he sees a golden opportunity to take Reagan down with him. Don't look down, Bonzo. Watch it, Bonzo, steady. Hey. After surviving his first assassination attempt, we learn that Reagan is playing a psychology professor named Peter. Peter wears pants that are two sizes too big for him and is engaged to the Dean's daughter, Valerie. But the Dean doesn't want them to marry because Peter is the son of a former criminal. 
So naturally, to prove that he's a responsible guy, Reagan convinces a German professor at the school to let him adopt Bonzo so he can try to raise him at home and prove that he can be a good dad. Aww. But as any single dad knows, being a father is really hard, especially when your child is not a child, um, it's a chimpanzee, and not just any chimpanzee, but a chimpanzee that loves doing backflips. <laughs> No, 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 it's no use. I'll have to give it up. I gotta get back to my classes. And he loves wrestling. To help get control of Bonzo, Reagan hires a babysitter, a 22-year-old girl named Jane. But remember, she may be 22, but this was 22 in 1951. So... I was really looking for a woman who had experience as a mother. I've raised five children. Do what? I'm uncomfortable. So now that Bonzo has a mom, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's bedtime for Bonzo. You know something? My brother Gus wasn't half as cute as Bonzo. Also, I've got a fun bedtime for Bonzo drinking game for y'all. Um, take a, take a little shot every time Bonzo goes to bed. This is water, by the way. The next day, Reagan goes to the store to buy some baby food. And Reagan, being the sadist that he is, decides that he's going to lie to an old man to get him to eat baby food, too. This won't go any farther. Well, of course not. Well, then, who has more energy than babies? And what do they eat? Of course. The Fountain of Youth. And while this seems like a very unimportant joke, according to one of my friends who watched this movie as a kid, she was so inspired by the flawless science Reagan drops here that she would literally beg her mom to buy her baby food at the store. And I believe that is what we call trickle-down economics. Maybe. I didn't pay attention in high school economics class, I'm gonna be honest. What's the matter with him? Maybe he thinks you're getting more attention than he is. An Oedipus complex already? Excuse me, Reagan, what? An Oedipus complex already? Oedipus complex? An Oedipus complex already? I mean, Bonzo did try to kill Reagan, so... I don't like this. Okay, so in this next part, Reagan and Jane decide they're gonna call each other mama and papa. What was really important in this scene is that we have a clip of Ronald Reagan saying the word daddy. Daddy would sound a little silly, wouldn't it? Y'all just do with that what you will. I'm not even gonna touch that. Daddy, 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 daddy. So after that, Reagan goes to dinner with his real fiance and admits to her what he's been up to. But he conveniently forgot to tell Jane where he was going and he forgot that it's Bonzo's birthday. So her and Bonzo stay up all night waiting for the deadbeat dad to come home. But he doesn't show, so Jane sadly brings Bonzo upstairs without eating the cake, because obviously that's how birthdays work. You know, if, if your dad's not there, you're not getting any cake. I'm sure Papa has a good reason for not coming home or, or even calling. The college professor's a very busy man, you know. And with a heavy heart, Jane puts Bonzo to bed. Again, this is water. Bonzo doesn't take this insult to his pride lying down, though, and he busts out of his bed like a super spy escaping prison. What was that noise? Whose footprints are these? That way! Where'd he go? Does this count as another bedtime for Bonzo? I mean, he got up and he's in a different bed now, so... Now cut to the next day, Bonzo uses his stealth skills to teach himself how to steal jewelry. And as a reward for his intelligence, Bonzo gets to take out his rage toward Reagan on the ball. Until Mama gets back. Not satisfied with the ball though, Bonzo also attacks a vacuum and accidentally hotboxes the room. And since Bonzo is a little baby and he can't handle the loud, he leaps out of an open window. Why would you leave the window open when you have a chimpanzee in the house? Why am I getting heated about plot holes in bedtime for Bonzo? What has my life become? Professor Boyd. Oh, Professor Boyd. It's working like a charm. Who has more energy than babies? Just watch. Go, 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 go. 
And then Reagan finds out that Bonzo has escaped and says perhaps one of the most outwardly racist things Reagan ever said. That's a boiler. Excuse me. Hans, our experiment's up a tree. Experiment? You know, my house guest, the young man who's visiting here from Africa. After the casual racism, Bonzo climbs into Reagan's room to place a little phone call. <laughs> What's the matter? Do you need help? <laughs> get the address for Brighton 634, then ring the fire department. Someone's trying to get help. It sounds as if they're suffocating. I'll call the police. Hang on. Fire. Suffocating. There's no way. There's no way that can be a coincidence. So the fire department shows up, but Bonzo is conveniently missing in action, so they leave. And then Reagan's fiance shows up and dumps him because she thinks he's cheating on her with Jane. I didn't know he was engaged to someone. It's his own fault. A papa should tell a mama when he's engaged to another woman. <laughs> Ugh, I hate when bad movies have good jokes. Father was right. You are what you are. Environment merely provides the camouflage to hide it. Bonzo celebrates breaking up Reagan's engagement by doing some more backflips. Flash forward a few weeks and Reagan's German friend learns that the college has sold Bonzo to Yale University. And he has to put Bonzo in a crate and ship him off on Monday. It's so sad. Whatever, whatever, who cares? Now look at Bonzo with a cowboy hat and a tricycle. Oh, look at him go. And now that his deadbeat dad is finally around to eat the cake, Bonzo gets to have his birthday. And then after that, they... Bonzo doesn't stay in bed for long though. Sensing that his life is in imminent danger, Bonzo takes his tricycle and hits the road. But before he escapes town, he rides past a couple about to get it on in a car on the side of the road and decides he simply must cock block them. <laughs> Satisfied that he's done his part to fight against the baby boom, Bonzo stops by a jewelry store to steal some diamonds so he can fund his grand escape. But then just when it seems like Bonzo is free, Reagan uses his presidential instincts to track Bonzo down and take him back. Fearing he'll be blamed for Bonzo's crimes, Reagan attempts to reverse heist the jewels back into the jewelry store and immediately gets arrested. Stupid, I'm not gonna let you get the chance. So now Reagan is being questioned for burglary. The interrogator calls the chimpanzee a finger man. This monkey is a finger man. And then he says the word swag. Yeah, but how about the swag? And finally Reagan is carted off to prison and Bonzo is shipped off to Yale, the way God intended. The end. I stare at the stars and the sky up above. Just kidding, actually, Jane shows up and clears Reagan's name. Bonzo returns the jewels. Reagan and Jane get together and they all live happily ever after with their 18 year age difference and their new not human son. The end. And that's bedtime for Bonzo. Um, I don't have anything intelligent to say as a conclusion because watching this movie has thoroughly fried my brain. But before I end the video, the whole adopting a baby chimpanzee thing and raising it like a human child, did any college professors ever try to do this in real life? Sadly, yes. In 1964, Maurice Temerlin, a psychology professor at Oklahoma University, and his wife, ironically also named Jane, took a chimpanzee named Lucy home to see if they could raise her like a human. They gave her clothes, toys, and a comfy mattress, and taught her American Sign Language and the difference between a salad fork and a dinner fork. The couple even hired a woman to act as a maternal figure, a 25-year-old woman named Janice Carter. And, and then, <laughs> and then, the family also gave the chimp access to pornography and copious amounts of alcohol. <laughs> Calm down, please. Calm down. Arriving home, the couple would frequently find their 
daughter on the couch, leafing through Playgirl magazines while pleasuring herself with a vacuum attachment. Obviously this was not going to fly for long. So in 1977, they sent Lucy to a nature preserve in Gambia. The caretaker they hired before, Janice Carter, accompanied the Tamerlan to Gambia on what was supposed to be a three week trip to help Lucy adjust to her new home. Lucy, extremely depressed by the upheaval and disappearance of her human parents, was unable to forage and unwilling to ditch her human diet for leaves. Carter extended her trip by a couple weeks, then a couple months, then moved to an uninhabited island in the Gambia River with Lucy and two other chimps unable to survive in the wild without help. She stayed on the island with her family of eventually 10 rehabilitated chimpanzees and without other humans for over six years. Carter was later forced to leave Chimp Island when one of the chimps suddenly attacked her in a display of dominance. A while after Carter left, Lucy was later found killed by poachers, likely because her upbringing made her too trusting of humans. If you wanna know more about this story, it's all covered in the HBO documentary, Lucy the Human Chimp. If you want a more condensed version of the story, there's also a 10 minute long video essay by Grunge that I'll link in the description below. Hey y'all, editing Ava, here my camera ran out of battery when i was filming this and when i replaced it i accidentally knocked my tripod and messed up the camera angle and i don't have any time to re-record it so just pretend like my head isn't cut off in the last few shots here okay um okay thanks uh, i love you bye but anyway that's the story of bedtime for bonzo thank you for watching I am evasive. And if you like this video, please subscribe and please let me know in the comments if you would like me to watch the sequel, Bonzo Goes to College, a movie that Ronald Reagan refused to do because it was, quote, too unbelievable. Then to show you the other rule of comedy they violated, they made a sequel, which I'm happy to say I wasn't in, called Bonzo Goes to College. <laughs> and, um, you know, and Hollywood did this a lot. If a picture made money, they would immediately come back with a sequel, but somehow they never seemed to be able to realize what it was that made the first one good. Now, the first one was based, as I say, on a basic sound premise. The second one, when they tried to have you believe that a chimp could make the college football team, uh, it was burlesquing burlesque. And as you know, in comedy, it never works.